talk a little bit about shock. And this is kind of, I'll admit, out of the two lectures, the more boring one. And you think it wouldn't be because it's shock. Shock's kind of fun. But um, the actual nitty gritty of the treatment of shock, Dr. Higginbotham's going to talk about. Um, so this is sort of the, the prelude to that. We are going to talk a little bit about, about shock and that sort of thing. But cases are a big thing now, right? This is a case that I had, oh God, five years ago, six years ago. So this kid comes in, small five-year-old, fever and vomiting. These are her vitals up there, kind of sleepy, dry membranes, sort of delayed cap refill. Shock? Who votes for shock? Absolutely. Compensated. Uh, uh, we'll see. Here's a two-year-old who has a history of acute lymphocytic leukemia who is currently in remission. She's been vomiting a couple times. These are her vitals up there. Shocky? All right. I like things that bounce on PowerPoints. I just, you know, it's, it's really annoying. The fellows hate it. Um, eight-year-old male. I don't have a picture of him. Oh, eight-year-old male with gastro. You know what they all look like. Blech. Decreased intake, decreased urine output, mom says. You get those moms that tell you he hasn't had anything to eat or drink for five days, and you look at the kid and you go, really? And then they have cheetosis. You know what cheetosis is? Everybody knows? It's like at three in the morning. You know, the kid's there at three in the morning in the ER and he's got a big Cheetos ring around his mouth, and he's got a Dr. Pepper in his hand, and mom goes, he won't eat anything. Cheetosis. All right. Shocky, that is a billable, codable thing by the, no, it's not, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> it ought to be. What do you think? Shock, a little febrile, sort of tachycardic, pressure's what it is. All right, who knows? I don't know the answer to that question. Well, no, we'll get to it. Um, so these are objectives today. We're going to talk a little bit about, about shock etiologies, and I think a lot of us know what the most common etiology of shock is in pediatric patients, but that's about to change a little bit, especially around here, and we'll get to why in, in just a bit. Um, compensated versus decompensated. To be completely honest with you, it's kind of a moot point for us, for us in the ER and for you guys out there, because at the end of the day, a treatment for the two is basically going to be the same thing. Later on, it might become an issue. You know, by the time the kid gets admitted, by the time the kid gets to the PICU, what's going on? But it's almost a moot point until, as kids always do, we're fine, we're fine, we're fine, and then what happens? We're not fine, right? And then we're going to talk a little bit about treatment, and more importantly, um, some of the pearls and pitfalls to watch out for with, with your shocky pediatric patients. Anytime you can do any of these things, it's a good thing. I know you guys get lots and lots of training. Anyone who is wondering about if they want to do extra stuff, PALS is a great course. They kind of changed it, though. They made it kind of harder, um, but PALS is pretty cool. Um, and, of course, ATLS and all this stuff. Uh, we teach an ATLS course almost about once a month down at, at uh, what used to be Brackenridge. Remember the old Brackenridge? Wasn't it great? Yeah, I love, I love the old Brack, but I still seating things too fancy. Anyway, all right, so... The reason people care about shock, officially, is we do care about kids' lives, and we do. But unofficially, the insurance companies will tell you it costs about $1.9 billion a year in treatments. So that's why people care about shock, let's face it. We don't, but the guys that are in the higher-ups are like, this is expensive. It is. Shock costs money, right? Shock is hard to treat sometimes, and people end up in the hospital for days, if not weeks. So shock is, is, is one of the leading causes of, of hospitalizations in kids, and certainly one of the leading causes of, of strains on the healthcare system. There's a variety of ways you can be shocky. The most common thing you're going to see in pediatrics is going to be dehydration usually, and then, of course, infection after that. I mentioned the cardiac thing. The reason I'm mentioning that is because um, you all probably know that, that uh, Dr. Fraser's group has really ramped up uh, doing heart surgeries on kids and all that, so we're going to start seeing a lot more cardiac kids um, in, our, in our area, the counties you, all, you serve, our county, everybody. So um, uh, it was nice having Dr. Stromberg here earlier because we're going to start needing a little more of that stuff uh, for us in the ER, too, and how to care for some of these heart kids. But these are the most common causes in kids and, of course, uh, most common reversible cause of pediatric deaths, bar none, aside from injury prevention, right? Okay, the good news is rates of shock, the death rates anyway, are decreasing. Why? We're recognizing it better. We're treating it more aggressively. Um, this is one of these things that, that sort of back in the day, I know when I was a resident and even as a fellow, they, they sort of were like, oh, maybe it's shock, maybe it's not, and a little bit of fluid here, a little bit of fluid there. You were kind of timid about it. People died when you did that. And so now the, the whole thing is if you think someone's in shock, you treat it and you treat it aggressively. Um, and so the most important thing, of course, is that we've had pre-hospital management and then, of course, what goes on in the hospital after that. All kinds of networks are out there in terms of surviving sepsis and PCARN and 
everything about, about guidelines for managing shock, but it's out there. And so early recognition and aggressive management is, is the key to, to surviving it. Y'all are essential for this because the first person who's going to be a shocky patient is going to be you. Maybe they'll go to their pediatrician's office. Maybe they'll go to urgent care. Those places typically are not capable of handling a shocky patient, let alone putting in an IV or starting fluids or anything like that. But y'all are, right? So you'll get a call from urgent care and they'll say, hey, I got one of these guys here and he looks really bad. I need you to come get him and take him to the hospital and, and start stuff. And when you get there, you guys are the ones getting the lines and starting the fluids. So what you do between the time you, you, you're on scene and getting them over to, to where they have to go is critical and essential. And, and the management decisions and the management you all perform is what really makes a big difference in, in the outcome of these kids. I will point out that the kid on the right up there is smiling. I've never seen anyone smiling in a papoose board, but whatever. <laughs> a couple of our residents trying to perform CPR. <laughs> I'm not kidding, they actually try like that. They, they look pretty, anyway. Um, all right, so. Uh, General principles, you got to recognize it first. That could be tricky in pediatrics, right? We all know that. Um, but you got to try to recognize whether you have shock or not. There is not a single vital sign or a single laboratory test we can either perform or find that's going to tell you if a patient's in shock or not. Sorry. They've looked, they've tried, there's not. And this identify the probable cause thing, you know, I, you might be able to do that, you might not. Um, it's a little more critical when it comes to, say, maybe heart kids or, or trauma patients. Um, but by and large, and even in the ER, we might figure out why the kid's in shock, but we try to reverse it and, and see how things go. There's our four types that everyone talks about. You know, whatever. Hypovolemia is the one you're going to see more than anything else in kids, right? They're dry, or they, they're infected, or they're bleeding. That, that's basically it. The one exception I alluded to earlier was cardiogenic, and these are the kids you've got to be a little bit careful about. Thanks to neonatologists, you can blame them or like them. Take your pick. Um, kids are surviving with cardiac lesions that wouldn't have survived 10, 15, 20 years ago. They're making it out of the NICU. They're getting fat, fattened up to get the repairs, and then they get into trouble between the time they're discharged and the time they get the repair done. Or they have some kind of staged repair, and then they're getting into trouble then. These are the kids you have to be careful with. The whole giving tons of fluid doesn't necessarily apply to a cardi cardiac kid, right? Neither does oxygen, neither does any of that stuff. And we'll talk a little bit about that later. But just bear in mind that, that uh, they're out there and there are gonna be more of them pretty soon. And by the way, parents are sometimes either really good at telling you stories and histories about the kid and sometimes not. The last cardiac shock kid that I had that came into the ER, he had sats in the 50s and was, I don't know where the expression blue as a goat comes from, but that's what he was. And um, he had a sternotomy scar and I asked the mom, what are his medical problems? None. Right. And so I go, okay, maybe not now, but what were his medical problems? I don't know. Something's wrong with his heart. So there you go. And he was some, some hypoplast that had his stages and you're just going, oh, great. Anyway, so they're out there. Parents are wonderful. Um, so this is the... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh -huh. um, this is the, uh, the boring definition of shock. You don't deliver oxygen to your tissues. There you go. We know all that. The whole point is to prevent this last step, which is irreversible shock, because then, unfortunately, you are going to die. Couple boring slides. The only take home with this is this. You can know all the formulas about stroke volume and cardiac output, and you can have a big conversation with Dan Stromberg, if you want, about all this stuff, and he'll, you'll impress him about all that stuff. At the end of the day, it's heart rate and how much you've got in your heart that you're going to pump out. That's basically it, right? That's what it amounts to. And then, of course, how you deliver that oxygen to the tissues and whether the tissues can, can absorb that or not and utilize it. So really, that's what we worry about. Heart rate and stroke volume. That's it. If you got those two, you got shock. Oxygen delivery, look at all these wonderful formulas. The intent, who cares? Oxygen delivery only depends on what the state of the tissues is and then what your cardiac output is, which is dependent upon heart rate and stroke volume. So at the end of the day, how fast your heart's beating, how much you're pumping, and then what's going on in the peripheral tissues, whether you can utilize your oxygen or not. That, that's it. And if you can't do that, then you're in shock. That's all there is to it. I mean, you can calculate all that if you want, but I mean, why? And more of that, same thing. One of the pr general principles of shock, what do we do when someone's in shock? We put oxygen on them, right? We're trying to increase the oxygen content of their blood if we can. The one caveat to that is cardiac kids, some cardiac kids don't need oxygen. Some of them, if you give them oxygen, will die. Some of them will get worse. Some of the kids that have, say, really, really bad um, congenital lung disease, if you give them oxygen, get bad. Pulmonary hypertension is a classic example of that. So you have to be a little bit careful about that, and that's where getting your history could be helpful. But at the end of the day, applying oxygen, by and large, is okay to do, and I'll do it every single time, unless some kid comes in a big chest scar. So this is why children are delightful. Yep. I have five, by the way, and uh, they, they, they pretty much look like that. Um, so 
the reason I put this up here is because, um, and you all, don't, you all are good at this, you, you know vital signs are different by age, right? They change at two weeks, they change at a month, they change at six months, they change at eight months, they change at a year. I mean, we all know that. A lot of places don't. And especially people that aren't really used to dealing with pediatric cases, especially, say, um, urgent cares that may not be used to dealing with shocky kids. Urgent cares, by the way, are great. I'm just saying that they'll be calling you asking, you know, hey, is this kid in trouble? I need to come, you know, what do you think? And I've had some, at least in Travis County, I've had some uh, EMS providers that um, the urgent care guy was, was, I mean, they got a nice five-minute education while they were getting the kids stabilized about, what normal heart rates were and what fluids they typically use. And, they, and the provider actually called saying, hey, I've got a great crew coming. They, they, they picked this kid up. They've done this, they've done that. And the only reason I know they did this because they told me what was going on and I, now I know. He had no idea about this kid that was in shock and the EMS guys did. So just know that 70 plus two times the age and kids over the age of, of a year or so is, is a nice, easy, lower uh, systolic blood pressure to have. And of course, this graph just is to scare you. Everything's great, everything's great, everything's great. Oh, it's not so great. And that's what they do, right? Okay. Is it easy to spot? Tachycardia. Yeah, right. Right? Who's seen a kid who's not tachycardic? They all are. Little jerks. Tachypnea. They're all tachypnic, right? They're screaming at you, yeah, 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 and carrying on, right? Delayed cap refill. Again, I love watching residents and fellows go in there and try to find the cap refill in the room that's freezing, you know? And it's like, dude, I, you can try it, but truthfully, if a resident can detect delayed cap refill, that kid's probably already in reversible, irreversible shock anyway. But um, it's helpful. Take a look at that. Extremities cool or not? What's a cap refill like? Mental status changes. To me, that's a little more of an important thing. But where, you know, the little kid that lets you do things to them, Either you got a weird kid or the kid's in trouble, right? We all know that. Um, the whole decreased urine output, that's tough. Parents never think their kids pee, especially when they're having diarrhea. And chances are the kid probably is peeing, it's just the diaper full of poop. How would you know, right? Um, but you can certainly ask about that. Hypotension, yeah, what happens if you're hypotensive? We all know, that's the end of the line, right? So these are the ones that I kind of look at more than anything else. Again, mentation is super important. What's the kid's skin look like? Dry mucous membranes, you know, that's another thing that's a little bit hard to kind of detect sometimes. I mean, if, if they're at the point where you can see that they're dry, you're probably well into, into dehydration or whatever's going on, right? Same thing with peripheral veins, pulses, you know, all that stuff. The kid's screaming at you. So these are things that we'll ask, but at the end of the day, mentation more than anything else, how's that kid acting is a big, big, big either red flag or, hey, we're doing well, right? My favorite graphs. Okay, so let's talk about compensated shock. Most of the people you're gonna see are probably gonna be in that, that stage for the most part. Everything seems to be going okay. Your body's doing what it's supposed to. Your heart rate's cranking up. Maybe you're breathing a little faster. Um, the big problem, the mistake that I've made multiple times is I sit on the kid and see what happens, right? And then I go, oh look, now he's worse. He's, there you go, that, that he's in shock, time to fix it. You don't wanna do that, right? You wanna get this fixed before you get to that point. So with compensated shock, you get all these things you typically see, and again, all the things that sometimes even normal kids are, are, uh, are acting like with fast heart rates and fast respirations. In terms of hemorrhages, this is more adult volumes, but for kids, roughly 5 to 25%, that kind of goes. And this is where you need to work your magic. Stop the bleeding, give oxygen, give fluids, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Okay, so now, Vizetti, you brought the kid to Vizetti, and Vizetti said, oh, he looks okay, I'm just going to go and do other things. And so I get busy doing other things, and then little Johnny is now beginning to go into uncompensated or decompensated shock. Now, uncompensated or decompensated, his perfusion's diminished. Now he's just kind of laying there, not doing a whole lot, not crying anymore, not really doing much of anything. Mom's happy because he's sleeping finally, and you kind of go, oh, he'll sleep all right. Um, blood pressure, if you can find one, eventually starts to drop off. Here's your mental status problems, right? And then your breathing starts to slow. It's amazing. You'll sometimes you get an asthmatic who's really tachypnic. You do some NEV treatments and then their tachypnia starts, you know, they start slowing down and everyone goes, yay. And when you listen, you can't hear anything. And everyone's going, look, he's breathing better. Like, no, he's about to stop breathing. And so um, same thing with, with, with uncompensated or decompensated shock. What is the, uh, the take home message with that column? Right there. You're in trouble. <laughs> yep. You may be able to dig your way out of it. You may not. Um, but you got to work fast, and of course, you know, saying a little prayer definitely, definitely helps. When you get to irreversible shock, all right, now you're in trouble. Um, very difficult to get out of, no matter what you do. Um, there are exceptions. This is where ECMO comes in, in some cases, right? Um, 
And at this point, things are starting to die off, including your patient. Make a fork, fork and dim is done is pretty accurate for the most part, but like I was saying earlier, there are exceptions. You know Owen, that kid that was on the news, the one that, that walked out of the hospital yesterday? You know that story about him, right? So Owen had super high quality PCR, uh, PCR, CPR, I'm thinking of, I'm, th I'm thinking of my next lecture already. Super high quality uh, uh, chest compressions and was able to get on ECMO machine, ECMO machine fairly quickly and, and you know, he got appropriate treatment. I mean, he got tons of fluids and, and he got better and that's because of, of the recognition that he was getting into trouble. But that's not the rule, right? A lot of people that are in irreversible shock typically, typically are, are, no matter what you do, you're kind of at, at the end of it. So you want to avoid that. And thankfully in, in most kids, in most cases, we don't get to that point. We're somewhere over here or in between these two. Okay, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's, that's, yeah. So my childhood, no, I'm kidding. Um, so, <laughs> You know, a lot of therapy. Okay, so um, ABCs, we all know that, blah, blah, blah. There's a reason for that, right? You lose the airway in a kid, what happens? You lose the child. I don't care how much fluids you've given. I don't care how quickly you got to the OR. If you don't have an airway, you're in trouble. So oxygen, a airway breathing, always first. And then, of course, because it's a shock lecture, circulation, vascular access. You know, interosseous devices have ruined everything for everybody because back in the day they weren't there, right? And you're doing cut downs, you're in central lines and all that. I can't think of a single PEM fellow in the past couple of years that's done really more than one central line. And we did them all the time. It was just, this is what you did. Kid came in, you know, can't get IVs, in goes the FEM line, in goes, the, I mean, just, we all did them, subclave and everything. IOs have ruined all that. They don't get that anymore. Anyway, um, so IOs work, they're great, um, and you can certainly use them. So stop the bleeding. The brief neuro exam part, if the kid is, you know, the two-year-old screaming at you, you're good. That's great. Um, don't, don't ask the two-year-old, you know, what year it is or who the president is. I mean, you laugh, but I've seen, I've seen not, not in the hospital, I've seen, um, there's a, a trauma fellow that did that. I did my fellowship. I was like, who's the president? Was like, He's two. We didn't know where he is. <laughs> anyway, but she did. She asked him that. She's a great fellow, but anyway. Um, and of course, this is why everyone hates the trauma base because everyone comes out of like you're just out of the sauna, right? Sweating like crazy, prevent hypothermia. And we do that with our nice warm blankets. So this is basically your goals, right? And like I said, Dr. Higginbotham is going to talk more about that. Really for, for pre-hospital care purposes, it's applying oxygen and giving lots of fluids. So if you memorize that, there you go. That's, that's a, a bit of an algorithm that, uh, that, that we'll use in the ER. Couple things I'm going to point out. Um, you'll, uh, what's your all's aside from fluids? Presser choice. What do you all like to use. Epi, you heard Epi too. Yeah. So um, for kids, it used to be dopamine. We gave dopamine all the time. Start them five ten, five ten of dopa, titrate up. Um, pretty much now, everyone just yeah, at least in 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 the ER setting and the hospital setting, they'll just hang some Epi and off you go. Um, you can certainly add dopamine and, and dobutamine depending, but epi is going to be your, your number one choice. And after that, maybe norepi depending on, on what's going on, but epi is a big one. But notice that when the first 15 minutes, you've already given a ton of fluid. You're at that point where it's fluid refractory or, or not. And the biggest mistake I think that we'll make in the hospital sometimes is that we'll say, let's give them a 20 per kilo bolus. And what we'll do is someone will go and hang it and set the pump to nine, 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 and you know, and then, then walk away like this and go, that happened, we all talking about that, right? And everyone's like, yay, he's getting fluids. And I'm like, he's gonna die, that's not what you do. So everyone now knows that you get the big old syringe, 60 cc's or whatever you got, and you push it in, and you draw some more up and you push it in, you keep doing that. And when the first couple of minutes, you've got a 20 per kilo bowl already in that kid, sliming the fluid in. And if you gotta do it again, you do it again. And you gotta do it again, you do it again. So when you start hitting, you know, is that 60, 80 per kilo part, now we're thinking, probably even a little before then, we're probably gonna be doing suppressors. And of course, in the trauma sending blood, right? That's the other thing that's different in peds. It used to be that we weren't as quick to hang blood as they were in the adult world. And you're gonna find that most pediatric literature in terms of how you practice is roughly five to even 10 years behind the adult literature and things. Because no one for some reason wants to experiment on kids. I have a few they can try. But anyway, um, so blood of course, you'll, you'll see that we're more apt to hang blood nowadays um, in, in the trauma bay than, than we were before. And then depending what happens, at this point, the kid is hopefully out of your ER and you've, on, you've moved on to bigger, better things. You can start going through here. The one thing that I will point out, aside from the epinephrine, is that a lot of times in kids, 
and the intensivists is sort of a trick they like to use a lot. Um, they will give steroids. In, in some kids, especially um, if you've got neonates, say, that may have uh, congenital adrenal hyperplasia that are, that are in adrenal crisis, they're not getting better. Um, it's the classic story as a kid that's on pressures, on antibiotics, not getting better, not getting better, not getting better. You give them a dose of steroids, and all of a sudden, we're better. The endocrinologists hate that because now they have to wait for it to happen again to get labs, but we're smart and draw labs ahead of time so they don't complain. Um, and I don't get an email with you forgot to draw the labs. But um, sometimes we'll give some steroids too that, that will do that. So these are the things you start thinking about. The other thing that, that, that we'll do too with, that's become sort of a new thing with, with pediatric shock is that we're using ultrasound more and more and more, one for vascular access, but two to take a look at the heart. Um, you know, you can get a whole debate about fast exams and trauma, and, and honestly, it's not all, all that great in kids, but it's great for looking at the heart. And if you have a big effusion there, it can certainly help you decide why this kid's not getting better despite me pumping tons of fluids and pressures into him. Oh, look, he's got a huge effusion in his heart. So we'll do that too from, from time to time, just kind of take a quick look. But yeah, you memorize that and you're, you're good. Really what we tell people is, is kind of like what y'all did. You pick a pressure or two that you like and you just stick with that for the most part and you'll, you'll get it 99% of the time. What should happen once you give fluid and even a trauma sending blood, you've got responders, they get better, yay. You got transient responders, these are the ones I can't stand because they get better, everyone's happy, and then uh-oh, the pressure's down again. So you'll have people that get better, get worse, and you only have the non-responders. This is what you should see happening. More than anything else, what you're gonna see and what we'll see in the, in the department will be the slowing of the heart rate just a little bit, and then they're looking better. Now they're getting angry, now they're moving around, now they're pushing you away, that kind of thing. Um, the rest of this, and of course skin color, the rest of this comes eventually, but, but that's kind of the top ones improve mental status. There was a study that came out um, talking about overfloating, over, over, uh, that's what I'm looking for, over resuscitation with fluids, right? And this was a study where it was done, um, I believe somewhere in Africa, and they actually had worse outcomes with more fluids in their pediatric population. The problem with that was where they were doing the study was sort of a resource poor area and they only had like maybe one regional kind of medical center that was hours and hours and hours away. So for our purposes, it, you really can't quite apply it to, to our practice area because we're, what you all will do, what we'll do is we'll just dump fluid into them. Are some of those kids gonna go into, into pulmonary edema and are some of them gonna have problems at least in the immediate period with, with over, over fluid resuscitation? Of course they are, but guess what? We can always take off what we put in. And so it, don't be afraid to push fluids. I mean, you'll hear people talk about this over resuscitation thing, but for the most part, you can get fluid all you want. And you know what, if it gets, if you're a little bit on the plus side, maybe you're a leader up, we can always take it off. So it, we'd rather have more fluid than less. Okay, a couple of things to think about. Vital signs are now for a reason, right? You, you, you gotta have a good set of vitals. And, and, and sometimes you can't, you know, that, that two-year-old. By the way, the answers to those cases, yes, one was uncompensated, three was compensated, and two was just a brat. So there you go. Um, <laughs> most pediatric patients will present with the cold shock scenario, dehydration, infection, that kind of thing, right? Most shock gets better with IV fluids. The one exception are gonna be your neonates. And then I would add, and I haven't yet, but your cardiac patients, right? Neonates are different because if you have a shocky neonate, it's okay to maybe do just 10 per kilo and kind of see where things go. You know, the kids under a month still will make it out of that place, out of that NICU with a heart lesion that no one knows about. And you start giving them fluid and they start getting worse and you kind of go, oh, that's not good. Um, and then also think about, of course, about uh, never trust neonates anyway. The cardiac kids are the same way. Um, and some kids will make it to 10 or 11 years of age without de detecting the cardiac lesion. We had a kid a couple months ago who um, had Alcapa, you know, anomalous left coronary artery, alpha coronary artery, yep. And he came in looking shocky and we were kind of going, hmm. So we gave him a whole bunch of fluid and he got way worse fast. I mean, he even actually, I never really even seen like flash pulmonary edema. Kids just don't generally get that. He did. He started like coughing up, you know, that whole pink frothing. I'm like, wow, is that what that looks like? I'd never seen it. Um, I saw it in all the heart babies post-op, but I never saw it in kids. And he, um, he was essentially, for lack of a better term, was having an MI. I mean, that's what it does to you. And he, his function was just, his heart was just kind of just quivering like that. Um, he did not tolerate a whole bunch of fluids, but we were to back off a little bit. He got better. He did great. He got fixed. But so you have to be careful with those kids. And then early recognition, aggressive management, you know, despite what I just said, um, if you have a kid, run of the mill kid especially, give them fluids. Don't be afraid to slam fluids at them. It's perfectly fine. It's okay to do. And, and that's what we're gonna do in the department. And then you watch, right? I just gave him 20 per kilo. He got worse. Maybe it's not all entirely a, a metabolic shock or a, a hypovolemic shock. Maybe something else is going on. <laughs>